This program is presented by the Prior Art Gallery on the campus of Columbia State Community College in Columbia, Tennessee, and is made possible by a grant from the Tennessee Arts Commission and through the support of the Columbia State Foundation. This is an artist's studio. There are small studios like this, large studios that are contained only by the walls of an abandoned factory, and even studios no larger than a kitchen table. But regardless of the studio size, it is the space where an artist's thoughts are put to paper, where her imagination and the colors of paint are splashed across the canvas, where the bliss of creativity overcomes the awareness of time, and where both torment and joy are given visual life. This is an artist's world. Hi, this is Rusty Somerville, curator of the Prior Gallery at Columbia State Community College. During this series, I'll visit the studios of six African-American artists from Nashville, Lewisburg, and Columbia, Tennessee, then down to Huntsville, Alabama, and finally, a bit further south to Kennesaw, Georgia. Each artist will discuss his work, giving insight into personal style, individual technique, use of color and composition, and also talk about personal artistic philosophy. So stay with me as we talk with and view the artwork of six African-American artists. This is an artist's world. Today I'm headed down to Columbia, Tennessee to visit in the studio with artist and art teacher, James Spearman. Over the years, Jim has received commissions from companies and institutions, including Ford Motor Company, the Art League of Michigan, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Here we are in Jim Spearman's studio. This is Jim, and this is his studio. Let me scan the entire studio so viewers can see this wonderful space, and then we'll talk with you, Jim, and learn more about your work. This is Jim Spearman's world. Okay, Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit about your paintings? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> these paintings, on these uh, couple of paintings are some of my probably very latest pieces that I've done. Uh, they're both oil on canvas, and that's my primary medium is oil on canvas. And uh, this piece uh, is a music theme, which I've been doing for the last several years, music theme. And uh, it's just a co kind of collage of characters, different musicians that I pulled out from different places. Uh, I particularly wanted a vocal and instrumental, uh, you know, like a wind instrument, a uh, string with a, uh, a guitar, the drums, and the bass there. So it's basically a, a music thing, and uh, as I said, that's probably one of the last pieces I've Done. Okay, now this one on this side, uh, I was motivated to do this particular thing. Uh, the name is He Ain't Heavy, and it was kind of inspired by the uh, some of the demonstrations that took place after uh, George Ford was, uh, incident took place. One person, black, white, helping each other, mainly what it was about. and. Uh, hasn't been shown yet before now. I love your choice of titles for this piece, Jim. He ain't heavy, he's my brother. I believe that's truly indicative of how blacks and whites should treat one another. Another favorite of mine, uh, this is called Legends because it has quite a few of the legendary musicians. Uh, has a mixture of uh, 
black and white musicians in it. And uh, I always looked at music as a, a place where you could find black and white really uh, doing things, playing with each other. And that's one thing I liked about the music is that uh, uh, it's a combination of both people, all of them, you can get along with each other. As long as you can play your instrument or sing, <laughs> then you, you're in the group. Uh, in this piece, I have some of the, the, the uh, legends like uh, Jimi Hendrix, Mick, Mick Jagger, and Aretha Franklin, uh, Ray Charles, um, Muddy Waters, and uh, Supremes, and a lot, of, a lot of stars, Backstreet Boys at the top. Uh, this is probably the second picture I've done like this. I was kind of inspired. Uh, I did a, did a painting that was larger than this for the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I was commissioned for them to do that. It was the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Ford Motor Company, and the Arts League Commission were partners in that. But my piece was the uh, was the centerpiece of their their uh, their t magazine and, and tour. This is one of my favorite pieces. Uh, as I, I've uh, indicated before, I've been very interested in music themes. And so uh, this piece is Prince, which uh, I always loved Prince, so I, I was always looking for a way to paint him that would kind of describe him as, as a person. So uh, I've included his symbol and different other poses of his in there and uh, this piece I probably completed a couple of two, three years ago. I, I don't put dates on my paintings so sometimes I forget <laughs> about when. But uh, this piece, uh, as I said, is one of my favorites and uh, again you'll you notice the kind of collage of her characters. Uh, which I, I, I really like, uh, a lot of portraits. Yeah, that's one of the uh, techniques that you like to, to use. It looks like the uh, collage effect with different right. characters yeah. in the same painting. Yes. This painting is, is uh, special. Of course, they're all special at one time or another until you paint another special one. <laughs> but uh, I forget the year this was painted, but I had always wanted to paint the African headdresses. When I first started painting, I was doing a lot of African uh, images. And uh, I knew, knew uh, some African uh, artists, and uh, they found out that I wanted to paint headdresses. So one of them uh, had just uh, gotten married. And uh, he had all kinds of pictures of his wedding. And uh, so he gave me all kinds of pictures of, uh, well, from his wedding and had all these beautiful headdresses. And, and uh, you know, that's the main reason that I painted this picture with headdresses. And the name of it is Tranquility. And so these two characters here are characters from his wedding and I used my wife in some pictures, so this one I painted one of the headdresses from his, his wedding onto my wife. <laughs> she never wore that, but <laughs> I used her, I had her pose for that picture and I put the headdress on her. But uh, it's been one of my favorite pictures and uh, it's, uh, it, I, I was very satisfied with it. So I, I've only done one picture like this with those hairdressers, and somehow they fascinated me, and you know, I thought they were beautiful. Well, it's a beautiful painting. Well, thank you. This piece is another favorite of mine, of course, and it's a dream come true. And a little story behind it, uh, I had never done a painting of Martin Luther King and uh, people who saw a lot of my portraits would ask me, why don't you do one of King? I said, well, everybody's doing Martin Luther King. I'd love to do one, but I want to do one different than everyone else. And when Obama 
I was president, I, I guess I felt that was the opportunity for me to do Martin Luther King with Obama, a dream comes true. And uh, I wanted to depict in this picture all the little characters uh, about the, you know, the people who really supported uh, Obama. It wasn't just black African Americans. I wanted to picture different ethnic groups that supported him. And uh, that's, that's how he, I felt he became uh, president. This is the second picture I've done of, of Obama. The first one I did a picture of him with uh, President Lincoln. And uh, because I, I knew that President Lincoln had been a, a favorite of uh, President Obama. This piece is one that's kind of showing my new direction, I guess you could say. Most of my pieces have been more detailed, uh, not photographically detailed, but uh, a lot of detail in them. And my interest now uh, is going more uh, uh, like kaleidoscope, uh, collage type of picture, and I'm still playing around with that. This one seemed to work out good, and uh, I plan to do more like that. Thank you, Jim. Your work is really wonderful. As we wrap things up, I'd like to say again how much we appreciate you letting us come into your studio. It's been a great day. Now, before we close, why don't you give viewers your contact information, and I'll show a few more pieces of your artwork. If anyone would like to contact me regarding my artwork, regarding uh, Zoom lessons, anything like that, uh, my phone number is 931-215-9445. I have a website that you can look at some of my work, and that is www.jamesspearmangallery.com. Dot com, and uh, you'll be able to see a lot of my work on that. Today I've come south to Rocket City, sometimes known as Huntsville, Alabama. For the next hour or so, I'll be visiting with Huntsville artist, teacher, and art collector, Johnny Moore. A central theme of Johnny's work is social commentary. His studio, which is housed in the sanctuary of an old Pentecostal church building, is the perfect space for an artist's studio. Johnny, I want to thank you for inviting us into your studio. Let me first film your studio space and then give you center stage as you tell us about your work or anything artistic you'd like to talk about. Beautiful studio, Johnny. Why don't you begin by telling us something about you? Well, I was teaching up until um, uh, last September, actually. I, um, I was teaching high school, helped get a magnet program started. Well, I should say I helped invigorate a magnet program uh, here in the city of local high school. And everything was going well. We were building a program. It was con con uh, growing considerably. And then when COVID hit, we were doing everything uh, virtually. And then we came back to school you know, they, I had nine classes before I had gotten up to nine classes, which was a lot. And then when they hit 11 classes, and I was forgetting where I put my keys, forgetting which colors to put where, I mean, literally everything was turning into itself. I decided, you know what, it's, it's time to go and do something different. The thing that I've been pushing my students to do, I tell them to go and search for a career that they never have to retire from. I realized that I was no longer excited about getting up in the morning and going to work because I was spending the majority of my time at the computer putting together plans for what I was going to do rather than actually doing that thing. And I realized that, okay, I'm not going to spend my life this way. So I left. I left and I had a part of this space and I started working in here, really put my engine into this. But I realized that, you know what, I'm an educator at heart. Um, my whole idea is to build. When I look at a blank canvas, when I think about students coming before me, it's about putting that vision into practice. So with this space, my goal is to turn it into a an operating space where people can practice their work. I do my work, we do gallery shows, and sort of a keyhole into the larger art world. That's, in essence, what I want to do from this particular space. So this is uh, one of my latest drawings. It's, uh, 
it's a drawing that falls in line with the paintings I'm doing with the, uh, with the lines. And I talk, I talk about the lines as a, to a sort of mapping. And we think about, I've been doing my, um, my, my family tree and going back through my history. And every time I go back, I keep running into the, this great wall of demarcation called slavery. And then there's all the ancestors and then there's this, this, this white guy that, that's there at that particular end. And I can't get anywhere past that. So when I think about that, I know my history goes beyond that. I know there's a line of a map somewhere beyond that. So what I have to do is look back and see, you know, different parts of Africa, uh, the Native Americans here, and that's my history of the past. I can't change that history. But what I can change is that history moving forward. But even still, the history moving forward, all the ones in the back is one line, just like my one life. This is all one line from beginning to end, which is like our lives. All those different twists and turns, all the relationships we had, uh, failed or not, all the places we've been, where we've worked, who we've been, been influenced by, it's all one line with those twists and turns. But with that, it's still us. And it makes that total picture or that total image of who we are. So that's what I was working on with this piece right here. This is the largest drawing I've done of this type. And believe me, it was grueling. Because to, to bend all these different lines and you get those moments to where it feels really, really good, then you get spaces where you feel almost lost. Well, what do I go here? What do I go with this? And you think about that's how life is. So I haven't really named this piece yet. Johnny, would you take a minute or two and talk about the folk art altars that you have built? So being from the South, being from Alabama, Alabama being very, uh, very much known for it, its folk art traditions. Now I can't call myself a folk artist because I've been to school, I've been trained and everything, but I'm still moved by the idea of these artists, these creatives, taking these items from around where they are and constructing these works of art. And to me that taps into something very, very, very spiritual, the idea of, of charging things with an energy from an area. I remember that uh, one of my professors told me when I was, a, um, I was a senior in undergrad and I had a show, and I must have been looking as though I was distraught or something of that nature because she told me these words that I've never forgotten. She said, this Alabama red clay is rich with the blood of your ancestors. And when she said that, those words etched themselves into my psyche. And so that everywhere I've moved from Pennsylvania to where I've gone, South America, I always carry with me a small uh, uh, vial of red clay as a, as, a as a remembrance for that, to remind me. So this was built from an old shipping box. And my son were discussing those boxes as I was bringing them in here, how those things then, they were able to be recycled. You take the wood and, you know, although it was like 1906 when this box was made and shipped, I don't know how many places, they could take it and reuse that box so many times, then once it wasn't usable anymore, either make something else out of it or use it for wood to burn. So it became recyclable. And it's called This Do in Remembrance. Because as a child growing up in the church, that was on the, uh, right before the podium in front of the church when they did communion. It said, this do in remembrance of me. So I like to think that each time I do the work, when I'm sitting at my desk, I'm at my drawing board, I'm at my easel, I'm out doing a lecture, that it's not just me. It's, it's me being infused with the energy, the influence of all those who came before me. Not just these luminaries, and I can name a few. There's William Hooper Council, the founder of Alabama A&M University, you know, John Lennon, Walt Disney, Eva Hess, Picasso, uh, George Washington Carver, um, uh, Frida Kahlo, and uh, Diego Rivera, Paul Robeson, Jean-Michel Basquiat, up top of the Sun Ra. These, these people had an impact on me. And these are all the artists, people who were classified as artists. Of course, there are others. But these are the ones who actually did things that would be classified as art. And here's one of the people are surprised to see, but that's Johnny Cash. I remember I told one of my professors in Chicago uh, that Johnny Cash was my hero. He said, well, I can't see, why Johnny Cash? And because he saw me as this, um, this fist-pumping radicalist, but no, people have impacts on us. And I'm not a fist-pumping radicalist, so maybe to some I am. But when I look at Johnny Cash's life, I remember being a child and watching the Johnny Cash show. And he's the man responsible for me beginning to adopt black as my, the major color of my wardrobe. You know, at one point, when you looked at my closet, everything was different shades of black. You know, people talk about different, different colors. No, mine was 
multiple shades of black, warm blacks, cool blacks, slate blacks. They were all in my closet. Plus, it made life easier to reach in and grab some things and go without that being a stressor. But this altar was built built in honor of them to to back me as I go forward. And sometimes, you know, if, if I'm feeling like, you know, a, a, having a challenge, every single one of these people went through challenges. And some of those challenges they, they share with me. Gordon Parks right here, um, I use his quote. He said, uh, um, the camera became his weapon of choice against those things that stood against him, you know, and growing up in, in the 19th century, or 20th century, with racism and everything. And the challenges of, of, of Walt Disney, he's, uh, he's right here. The challenge he had, being depressed when his character, Oswald the Rabbit, was taken from him. But on his way back from LA to New York, he sat there and sketched out this little rat that he called Mortimer at first that became this icon we know as Mickey Mouse. And from that, that thing that we see as a pest, an empire was built that continues to inspire people. I know people talk about them being, you know, the ultra capitalists and everything, but when I go to, when I go to Disney World, I'm so inspired. All of that, it all started with the mouse. So those are the kinds of inspirations that I draw from these people right there as I continue my trek. Uh, uh, through this journey called life. So this morning, uh, a university president came by. She wanted us to go visit and talk about some things that she would like to have for the, for the school. And one of the questions she posed was, why is it that so many of your images are, are females? And I explained to her that, um, well, well, number one, I just prefer to draw women over men. I think they're much more attractive to look at. But even beyond that, it's the idea of, of the feminine energy. Um, and one of my goals is to, um, like I call this space the church. And church is an acronym for come help us restore cosmic harmony. And in restoring that cosmic harmony, I look at the imbalance in our world right now. I feel there's a lot, there's way too much toxic masculinity. So with that, my idea of, of bringing forth the feminine energy, the female images, helping to restore that, in, that energy or that balance. Now, this particular piece is called uh, Beyond Her, and it's spelled capital H-E-R and then small e, which also is being, be, can be seen as Beyond Here. Because amid all the chaos that's going on, she has this solid look, this intent look of faith, pointing out beyond those times. Moving Beyond Her, could you tell us the title and a little bit about this next piece? So this piece, um, it doesn't necessarily have a name yet, but the, we think about what's happening over the last few years with even the, with the vote. We think about women's suffrage. There's been a lot of focus on that in the last few years, especially here in Alabama, even in Huntsville uh, proper. They had a mural that was just done last year about women's suffrage. And the women who actually got that started in the state of Alabama, most of them were from, the, from right here in Madison County. Uh, so when you think about that, the idea of that, uh, that move forward, the vote, and things of that nature being in the hands of those women and the power they had, it reminds us that so many things are based on that feminine energy. So we have these keys, of course, in threes. We can look at that as a trinity, faith, hope, charity, or love. And when you think about those, those three things, you can use those as keys to move you anywhere. Number one, you have to have a love or passion for something, whatever that thing is. Because when you feel like giving up, it's that passion that's gonna keep you going, okay? It's that, that's, that's that love part of it, all right? That hope part is what triggers it anyway. You have to have the hope for it. You have to be able to see that thing before it comes, which falls right into the faith aspect of it. When those three things work together, and that's from Corinthians 13, by the, matter, uh, by the way, when I was a child, I had to memorize that and recite it for the church. Uh, much of my chagrin, but my dad, he was, at any opportunity he had, he was having me recite that, um, <laughs> recite that verse. In fact, I had a call from him a few weeks ago, or well, a call from a friend of mine a few weeks ago, said, I was at your dad's house, and he was telling us how you memorized that text, and you probably still knew it, and believe it or not, a lot of it I still do know. <laughs> said it so much. But that's it right here. We think about that, those three things, those three pillars, but, you know, in, in every dark period, if you can't find the light, it's in search for the light, you have to become the light. So this period of moving forward, of having those keys to unlock those new doors or those long locked doors, um, I think that uh, we're on a, a liminal, we're in a liminal space on a burgeoning new time where we're going to see some things different. And I think the, the hardest thing is going to be 
allowing them to be different and allowing that change to take place. Well, Johnny, that about wraps things up for today. Your artwork and the thought behind your work are both wonderful and inspiring. I'd like to thank you for visiting with us today. If anyone would like to contact Johnny, he can be reached at area code 256-527-6288. Or you can see more of his artwork at johnnytheartist.com. Here we are on I-75, headed south to Kennesaw, Georgia, just a little bit north of Atlanta. As you can see, traffic is already getting heavy. Today, we'll visit with artist and professor of art at Tennessee State University, Samuel Dunson. Thanks for inviting us down to Kennesaw, Sam. Before we start, let me give viewers a quick look around your studio then I'll give you center stage and let you talk about yourself. Okay, Sam, you're on. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Samuel Dunson and uh, I'm an artist uh, living actually in Kennesaw, Georgia. Uh, but my, I would say my art home base is uh, far more connected to Nashville, Tennessee, uh, where I actually went to college and uh, actually have taught for the past 28 years in the uh, at Tennessee State University's art department. Um, I have uh, basically been, I guess I would consider myself to have been an artist very young, um, but didn't recognize the, I guess you would say the, the intricacies of it until I tried not to be an artist <laughs> as a college student and uh, actually didn't do too well and found out that my love was in the arts. You're actually in my studio space here in my home in, in Kennesaw. And as I said, I do teach at Tennessee State University. Uh, when the school is face-to-face, -face, uh, basically the, only, the pandemic is closed like most universities, but face-to-face, -face, I'll go up on Mondays, teach my courses, and then come back home on Thursdays. Um, I'm standing in front of a, of a work that's uh, entitled MK Ultra. Uh, this is a work that basically uh, uh, created about two years ago, almost exactly two years ago. Uh, it was near the end of a series of, of works that uh, I called Scorched Earth. You know, so it was basically my Scorched Earth series where I was dealing with, um, this was soon after the, well the Scorched Earth series kind of started soon after my sort of anger towards uh, almost like the world and everything else back in 2016 when um, death of, of black men and, and I mean sort of shootings and killings were just kind of on the rise and it almost seemed very similar to like uh, what I had heard from my parents like back in the 60s. So it was a sense of anger that was in me that was rare uh, just due to the fact that I'm, I'm more of a, of a lighthearted person. So uh, having a son and a daughter that I feared for kind of forced me to deal with some works that were a little bit different than I had ever dealt with. And this series kind of dealt with the issues that I had afterwards, kind of dealing with all of that stuff. So there was a, uh, a little bit of an idea, I guess you would say, of MK Ultra, which, is a, which was a, a governmental, uh, I guess you would say test program to see what the effects of LSD and other psychotropic drugs would do to to the human mind and to the human body, so on and so forth. And I felt like the world I was living in was kind of almost as if the, the world had given me a drug, almost, that I had no idea how to, how to react to, how to live with, and it was almost like a, a sense of a blinder had been put on me and I was trying to feel my way through uh, to make some sense of, the, of my surroundings and so on and so forth. So uh, what this is, is kind of a play on that idea of basically a, a group of people play, I, I like to play with symbology quite a bit. Uh, so thinking of, I guess you would say, the fairy tale of three blind mice and kind of who's leading who, uh, I was, had not, not fears, I'm not a fearful person at, at nature, but having distrust at that point in time in kind of like the leadership, uh, distrust in kind of the world, 
but still kind of wanting to see things in my own head. So what you're looking at here is a is a basically a painting of myself uh, with kind of like the VR glasses on. Not to say kind of with VR glasses on, and. Uh, if you think about the idea of the VR glasses, it, it's a creation. You know that it's a creation of someone else that is attempting to give you an understanding of their world and through their eyes, but also trying to give you a sense of, a for my work here, a sense of beauty um, to kind of make you feel good about the way that you I mean, about the situation you're in, as opposed to actually experiencing the situation that you're in. So that whole idea of the government giving people psychotropic drugs would alter the mind and kind of play with things so they would not fully understand the world that they were living in, but they have, would have created a world in their own minds. So Sam, your Scorched Earth series has given us some insight into your creative process. Could you tell us where that process is taking you? So as I was saying with the previous works, uh, that Scorched Earth series, kind of the, the play on the idea of, not really, no, let, me, no, let me not even say that. It wasn't even a play on the idea, it was an acceptance of the idea that things grow from destruction. So I, I knew that I wanted to kind of play with that idea of knowing that this was an actual tricycle from the 1940s and uh, the, we were just, I mean, if we think about the last election, we were coming out of a, uh, a system that was an idea of making, of making America great again. And I had always wondered what the idea of the, or, or the time period of again was, well, when, like, when was that time period? And it wasn't, I mean, I, I'll be very honest, if it wasn't the, the idea of trying to get at that particular idea or anger within that system or anything like that. Um, but it was like, okay, if it's going to say again, then it must have been at some point in time a great, all right? But then looking at, at who was it great for, it's, I mean, so there were so many questions that kind of came up. So with the tricycle, I uh, kind of played on the idea of making America great again um, and the, the cycle that goes into that, that concept of trying to bring back something that was kind of older and antiquated, not the best for anything, but making something, making that statement, make something seem beautiful, that's broken. Uh, so with the tricycle, one of the, one of the main things of the, of the tricycle when I got it was the fact that it didn't have, it didn't have a working wheel, all right? So uh, the, the wheel's broken, it only had one of the wheels, so I created a wheel for the tricycle. Uh, and Think of the idea of putting flowers and growth and beauty on something that has been refurbished. You want that thing, whatever has been refurbished, to be beautiful, but also to be functional. Um, but it wasn't functioning. I mean, it, I mean it, in my head, that idea was not functioning for me. Um, so it kind of dealt with this idea of this tricycle of, that, that was amazing and interesting and had growth on it and was beautiful and all of that but you can't ride it i mean it's like it's nice to look at nice to say uh yeah make america great again. beautiful thing beautiful idea of making america great we all want that but that idea is something that what well, didn't really feel like it was something that was being put into action this uh this particular painting the title working title in my head right now um, is Alice in Wonderland, uh, kind of play on the idea of Alice in Wonderland. Sam, when creating a piece, do you begin with a completed concept in mind, or does it develop as your painting progresses? This is not finished in the least. I mean, there's, there's plenty of more work to be done. It's actually kicking my behind right now. I mean, and that's the beauty of, of I guess, being an artist is you're not going to have works that are going to be laying down for you and say, okay, all right, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll be into your wheel and I'll, I'll make sense while you're doing it. This is not making any sense to me at all right now, but I'm enjoying the process of fighting with it, going back, doing some research on certain things. And, and the way that I paint is anything that I kind of think of, I just go ahead and put it in. 
I'm more of a jovial person, and my way of figuring things out is to see humor in things first and then figure them out a little bit later. I want to finish up by saying that I've really enjoyed my visit with you, Sam. Your laugh, your smile, and your positive attitude are infectious. Thank you so much. If anyone would like to get in touch with Sam, he can be reached at area code 615-630-5114. Or you can view more of his artwork at www.samueldunson.com. As you have seen, an artist's world or his studio is a unique space. In fact, it's as unique as an artist's use of color and composition, her personal technique, or individual artistic philosophy. I hope you've enjoyed hearing from these artists and seeing their wonderful work. Until next time, this is Rusty Somerville for An Artist's World saying thanks for watching.